Greetings and welcome back to the podcast. This episode, we are joined by Mr. Greg Robb, CEO of Helium Evolution, a TSX venture listed company with a market cap of approximately $17 million. Mr. Robb has worked as a geologist in Western Canada since 1984 and has held executive level positions in several exploration and production companies, including founding Salvo Energy Corp in 2006. Mr. Robb holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics from the University of Alberta, a Bachelor of Science degree in Geology from the University of Calgary, and a Master of Science degree in Geology from the University of Alberta. Among other things, we discuss the investment case for helium, how prices have risen to approximately $600 in MCF, and why demand for helium is rising. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Galatea Technologies. Galatea is a software company based in Calgary that is focused on helping producers better manage their fluid logistics. Galatea enables field operators and truck drivers with the ability to make the optimal decision on every waste, water, or clean oil load resulting in 20% savings on trucking and disposal costs. The Galatea platform makes it easy to create digital truck tickets, manifests, and shipping documents that automatically flow through the field data capture and finance systems. Galatea's platform is used by over 50% of Canadian producers, 600 trucking companies, and hundreds of disposal locations. Visit GalateaTech.com to learn more about how to optimize that last line on your lease op. This podcast is brought to you by Eva Software. Eva is a next-generation analytics platform powered by McDaniel Research and tailored specifically for oil and gas to quickly derive insights that matter to energy operators, investors, and advisors. Eva is the only platform that leverages public data, in-house operator data, and exclusive data sets interpreted by professionals at McDaniel Research. This combination allows rapid analysis of the most complete data possible, enabling better decisions around A&D, completion design, and optimal field development. Visit TuringAnalytics.net to learn more about leveraging EVA to uncover hidden trends, make informed decisions, and stay ahead of the competition. This podcast episode is sponsored by Inveris. Inveris is the world's largest energy-dedicated software-as-a-service company committed to helping customers close the gap between data and value creation. Inveris has been supporting the Canadian energy industry for over 30 years. Visit Inveris.com for more details. Good morning, Mr. Greg Rob. Thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate your time. Happy to be here. You're the CEO of Helium Evolution, but for the listener, what is Helium Evolution? We're a junior helium exploration company focused predominantly in Saskatchewan. We've looked at some other areas, but we settled on Saskatchewan because of the attributes of that particular area. I thought for the purposes of today's conversation, we could structure it around a investor that is curious about helium and what Helium Evolution is up to. So a litany of questions uh, along those lines, if that works for you. Fine, let's go. You're a geologist by trade. Yeah, oil and gas for oh, 35 plus years, then sort of switched over to the helium track about four years ago. It's the same skill set, exploring for helium as uh, exploring for oil and gas in Western Canada. We use an extensive amount of the oil and gas database, so it, it fit nicely. But yeah, uh, our whole team are ex-oil and gas people. So we got an engineer that's got, you know, 35 years experience, a landman that's older than dirt, a geophysicist that's, you know, in the same same league. So we've all got this tremendous oil and gas background and uh, a lot of experience in the Western Canada Basin. Yeah. How'd you get into energy and why geology? Uh, it was kind of an accident. I was going to university. I was actually uh, doing an economics program at U of A and I had to take a science option and the advisor said, well, why don't you take uh, geology? So I took uh, geology 201, 203, and I actually decided that I liked it better than economics. So I, fin- I finished off the economics and then and then went into a, a geology program and, and stayed there. And uh, it was it was more interesting. Economics, I mean, uh, I still have textbooks for <laughs> Those nights when you have a hard time sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> but you worked traditional oil and gas for quite some time. Yeah, I worked a bunch of things. Um, uh, some oil sands as well as, as conventional oil and gas. I was involved in drilling the first horizontal wells in Alberta with uh, AEC way back in the uh, late 80s down in Suffield. So I got a lot of experience over the whole basin over the years. 
a lot of interesting things to work on across Western Canada and lots of smart people to to learn things from. But here we are at Helium Evolution. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why start Helium? How did that happen? Right in, in the middle of, well, not in the middle of COVID, at the beginning of COVID, in March of 2020, I was working as a consultant and that was drying up really fast because of the situation with COVID shutting down everything and we saw what happened to oil and gas and, and the oil and gas market prices went negative. Anyway, in, in March of 2020, someone actually approached me with a helium prospect and it was in Montana. We have kind of a philosophy. My two partners at the time who are involved here, John uh, Kandurk and Pat Mills, we have a, a philosophy where if someone wants to show us a play or an idea, we always look because you just never know what you're going to see. And um, this guy wanted to show me a, a helium prospect in Montana. And so I went and had a look. And we liked the idea. There were some problems with the play, mainly, you know, things are different across the border. Land tenure was different. And it ended up being very small. It was, you know, two or three sections. We kind of liked the idea. We didn't like the particular play. And so in our discussion among ourselves, well, you know, the economics look pretty good. Where would this apply? So it's again one of these situations where you go and look at a play and it morphs into something else. So uh, we started looking around. We looked at Southern Alberta. We looked at helium plays up in the arch and started just digging around. We settled on Saskatchewan being a good jurisdiction. John Kandurka knew Jim Baker, who's now our our chair and called Jim and dug into a bit more. Uh, we started posting land in uh, the fall of 2020. We really sort of started putting things together. And so it came about just as, you know, someone just showing us an idea. And then all of a sudden it snowballed and we kept posting land and we ended up with a year later with 5.6 million acres. Is the idea that helium is an undervalued opportunity and there's kind of a hole in the market? Well. It was it was evolving fast. Five, six, seven years ago, helium was trading for about eighty dollars in MCF, but it was quickly becoming evident that supply was rising much slower than demand, or supply was actually falling, particularly in the U.S. And so there was going to be a, an opportunity. And of course, now we have helium prices that are in the five. $600 an MCF US range. So we kind of saw that things were changing and we weren't the only ones. And so we, we jumped in with both feet. And, you know, if you don't have the land, I mean, you're at a disadvantage. You need the land to have the play. You can farm in, but this actually worked out the other way for us. We ended up getting a bunch of land and then had the biggest player, North American Helium, farming in on us. The land play was was a good move for us right off the get-go. We knew that a lot of the land was going to be moose pasture, but we didn't know exactly where. So actually, we had a guy do an analysis for us, me and McQueen, and he did a really good job. It's on our website. He looked at our land and did a bunch of machinations with it, and he came up with the idea that about 6% of the land at the end of the day is going to be valuable. And we're fine by that. It's still a very large number, but you got to find it's like you know looking for the needle in the haystack. Helium is rare by definition, and we are fortunate to have a bunch of it in Canada. That's the idea, particularly in Saskatchewan. Yeah, it's rare, and it's it's hard to contain. It escapes. In Saskatchewan, the GSC numbers, geological survey numbers, are that there's like some 70 BCF of helium. In Canada, that's a old, stale, stale number. I suspect that it's quite a bit higher now, but nobody's really delved into it. Most of the helium around the world is produced as a byproduct of natural gas production. This is different. This is produced with nitrogen as the dominant raw gas. So there's very little hydrocarbon in the system. It's not produced as a byproduct. It's it's the primary product, although nitrogen is the dominant gas, 96%. How does helium evolution make money? Well, we don't yet. We're in the exploration phase. We're pretty close to getting to production. It's going to be partly driven by our partner, North American Helium. But we're hoping in the next 12 months as we go through this next phase of drilling, we have a, a prospect in an area called Mancota, North American farmed in, and they drilled some earning wells. We've drilled some joint wells. And the last three wells that were drilled in the fall and then into uh, the first quarter, we had three discoveries on this 
what we call the Mancota trend. Uh, now, in discussions with North America, and the idea is that they'll drill six to nine development wells there in the next drilling season. There is some surface access complications, uh, environmental stuff, seasonal things with fish and furs. They also have licensed a plant in the area that these wells would be tied into. So as this next phase of drilling occurs, we expect that these three discoveries will be developed and then we'll get some production on and then uh, cash flow. So 12 months from now, I think the, the look of the company is a lot different. In simple terms, you contract the drilling rig, it goes out to the site, drills a well. Hopefully you find helium in the ground. It's then produced up to the well put into a pipeline and sold into the market. It doesn't go into a pipeline. This isn't like natural gas. Um, so there's no common carrier. There's no midstream. Well, there's midstreamers, but they're further away. You build dedicated plants on site. The pools are relatively small. The bigger ones are like six, eight sections maybe, and maybe that many wells. And you build a plant on site that separates the helium from the dominantly nit nitrogen-based gas stream, and you put it in tube trailers and then those trailers go down the road to final processing or a final user. So a really good helium well is like a 50 MCF a day well. So if you have a little pool with half a dozen wells and you're doing, you know, a couple hundred MCF a day, that's a, that's a winner. The trucks will hold 300 MCF of helium. So you're filling up a truck every, you know, a good pool, you know, every two or three days, say. Sometimes it goes off to a liquefaction site. Those are in the United States right now. There's talk of building one in Saskatchewan, uh, hopefully at Swift Current. The product goes off to the end users, aerospace, um, high-tech companies, that kind of thing. So this isn't, it's not the same as natural gas processing. It's highly specialized. And so you can't put it into a pipeline, unfortunately. That would be an easier way to handle it or a, maybe perhaps a cheaper way. So the processing is specialized and relatively expensive. But the nice thing is helium prices are currently 500 to $600 per MCF, and you can produce several hundred on a good well. Yeah, you can produce, you know, 50 MCF a day wells, uh, you know, a, a big well. So that's profitable. <laughs> really, pro yeah, yeah. And the, the helium price, I mean, the market is really opaque Trying to find a spot price is difficult. We've seen things in the press. Last year, NASA signed a contract at $1,100 US. And that would be for a really high grade, 99.999, what we call 5.9 helium. So a, a special contract. That's a, an unbelievable price. We've seen other guys sign them for, you know, five six hundred dollars $600. There is a geopolitical element. Most of the helium is coming from as a byproduct of natural gas, and a lot of it is now coming as a byproduct of LNG production. So where you have really low helium concentrations, but you're running a an LNG plant that's doing several BCF a day, you can put a helium scavenger on the end of it, a, a plant, and get you know a couple hundred MCF a day of helium. The whole market. And this is kind of astounding. It's a specialized thing. Helium production worldwide is about 6.2 BCF per year. Natural gas production is about 141 trillion cubic feet per year. It's way, 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 way bigger. So the helium is, is a tiny thing. The LNG that's coming out of Qatar, Algeria, and supposedly Russia's Amur plant, they're on the other side of the world. And there's geopolitical implications. So we think that Saskatchewan is well-placed vis-a-vis the U.S. market, which is going to consume about 30% of the world's helium. What are the decline rates like on helium wells? And one of the negative things about oil and gas or unfortunate I, things is the wells decline. Yeah, and, and this will too. I mean, this is, if you want to look at it that way, it's like a natural gas play. So you're pressure deplete the reservoir. We use a 10-year lifespan for the reservoirs. It's probably longer. We're running economics based on that. What we've seen is that the producers take it easy on the wells, so they don't produce them full out. For instance, the, the pool in the Mancota that North American produces, they produce their wells at about 4 million cubic feet a day raw. So they're getting about 1% helium, so 40 MCF a day-ish out of those wells. If they open them wide, they could produce... 
tens of millions a day, but you want to not do any reservoir damage. And, and you know, we're learning a lot about the reservoirs and how to handle the, the gas. It's, it's kind of the prudent thing to do, certainly at this time. They could do more. The facilities that I mentioned are, are, are specialized and relatively expensive. And we have a, a sort of a rule of thumb. It depends on if you want to produce balloon-grade gas or 5.9 gas. But we use $2 million cost per million cubic feet of raw gas per day. So if you're producing 10 million a day of raw gas, you're looking at a $20 million plant. If you want to produce 20 million a day of raw gas, you're looking at a $40 million plant. Depending on how much you want to spend on facilities, you're going to have to take that into account. The The capital costs are very high. And so you model it all out and, and find a sort of a middle ground to maintain your your rates and you know meet your contracts. Mm-hmm. That's sort of the way that we look at it. Just a quick thank you to one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back to the show. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. For the listener, what do you use helium for other than balloons? <laughs> other than balloons. Balloons are actually, I think the balloons are now about 7% of the market, but that includes weather balloons and things like the Goodyear blimp. But um, a lot of high-tech stuff. It's used in aerospace. It's used in rocketry because it's inert. They use it for purging fuel tanks of really, really combustible stuff. They use it in manufacture of chips because they can manufacture very, very high grade chips in a non-reactive environment. Fill a room with with helium and you don't have anything that'll oxidize. It's used in fiber optics. Uh, It's used as a coolant in MRI machines. That's That's a very big one, actually. And the problem with helium, which actually works out kind of in our favor, is that it's really hard to contain they have to keep adding because they're getting losses all the time. It, it's a, the smallest molecule and it escapes. Mm-hmm. If you are running you know, any of these processes, a, a clean room, you're going to have to be adding helium to your system periodically to to maintain that. You're just going to have losses from use. So those are some of the things that you see. It's also used as a in welding and a lot of, we see CO2 and argon used as well. So it's used as a, a gas in welding. It's all high tech stuff. So this is what happened in the US. Their traditional sources were old gas fields that were declining. And at the same time, technology is advancing fast. You're losing your supply while demand is growing quickly. And it's created this this market. So the price adjusts and you know, I guess it's inelastic in terms of a commodity. So what was the price per MCF like five years ago? I think you said oh, eighty, and now it's five to six hundred per yeah. MCF. That's a lot of opportunity. Yeah, and and I mean, normally when you see those kind of things happen, supply comes on, right? That will likely happen too, uh, particularly with these big LNG plants. Stuff that you have to move, you know, across oceans. Number one, there's a geopolitical element, and number two, there's it. Some of it's escaping while you're moving. We think that it it's a touchy area trying to predict prices. I mean, we see it in oil and gas all the time, how how crazy it is. And with helium, we have even less sort of public data. But we, we've, we've seen, Peters did a study last year. Peters and company have one. And they think that sort of a base price in North America will be about 500 bucks just because of the supply and demand and the geopolitical considerations. How do you move it around? It gets moved in very small volumes. That makes a pretty darn good market, and it sort of justifies the risk of uh, drilling for it. Are there financial contracts set up so you can hedge out production in the helium markets? Not that we know of yet because we don't have any contracts. What we've seen are sort of short-term contracts, like very short-term. There there are spot markets. They tend to be institutional universities, uh, hospitals, they buy small volumes when they need them. The longer term stuff is sort of three to five years. Those are pretty good contracts. You're going to want to be sort of over $450. And then you can, yeah, then you can make a budget on that, right? 
But again, the market is very opaque. The, there's a middle group, the traditional sort of specialty gas uh, suppliers, Air Liquid, Air Products, um, uh, Matheson, Linde. There's a handful of them. They kind of like being in the middle and having big fat margins. And so those contracts are private. Now, us being a public company, if and when we get those contracts, I mean, they'll be, uh, they'll be buried in the, uh, the fine print somewhere. But we, we do have to disclose what our, you know, you'll be able to figure it out. Will lenders land on helium reserves? Probably. I mean, we, we're not quite there yet. There is no 51101 for helium right now. And again, it's a very, very small market. Are they going to go there? Yeah. I mean, we've talked to some of the reserve evaluators, McDaniels, and we view it as you can do numbers very similar to measuring natural gas reserves. So we don't think it's a, it's a real problem, but it hasn't been legislated yet. I would expect that if you get a good solid reserve report, and especially if you have cash flow, you should be able to, to bank it somehow. I know that there are a couple producers that have bank lines, so they've done some kind of measure of it. If I'm correct, you are the top inside owner at Helium Evolution. How important do you think that is to be aligned with everybody else in the company, especially the CEO? Oh, I think it's important. I mean, we have skin in the game. We're fully vested with what goes on. I think the insiders, I think we have 27% of the the float. And then there's also sort of the families and friends, which adds probably another five plus. We're, we believe in what we're doing. I think it is important. It, it's something that I think uh, shareholders appreciate. We also have very modest GNA here. We're keeping our costs down. The, the capital goes to the projects. We are, we are fully aligned with the shareholders. If we succeed in finding and uh, selling helium. The shareholders benefit, and we're all shareholders. So that's that's the way I look at it. We, you have to have uh, alignment there. If you don't, yeah, I wouldn't be that interested in investing in someone that doesn't. I guess. If you're to zoom out on the strategy of the business, is it to grow into a running operation? Is it to maybe try and sell the company a few years? Is it just to pay yourself some nice dividends? How do you think about the company going forward? Uh, we like what we're doing. We're having, you know, we're, it, it's an interesting project, especially after working in oil and gas for a long time. This is kind of a refreshing and revitalizing in a way. It's quite different. I, I don't want to be doing this 10 years from now. So I would expect that there will be at least a change in the management group and, and perhaps a sale. Hard to tell if and when those things will happen. I mean, if there's a harvest mode, yeah, I, I could see the shareholders and uh, the management group being interested in that. The revitalization part, this is kind of interesting. In, in the, the 50s and 60s, when exploration, wildcat exploration was taking place in, in Western Canada, they were drilling wells right to the basement wildcat wells. And what they found was that in the Cambrian section, the lowermost sedimentary package, there's no hydrocarbons. So they came to that realization in the late 50s, early 60s, and they quit drilling down through the Cambrian. So we have very little control down there. In the 5.6 million acres that we put together, there were five wells that went to the basement. We now have 16. So we've gone from one well per million acres to three. <laughs> so it's still pretty thin. So what we found is, okay, we, we have to extrapolate a lot. Every well is very much an adventure. You know, we have geophysics. We're not drilling blind. And we have geophysics on everything we drill. But nonetheless, when you get into that lower section, there's surprises on every well. There's a, a major glacial event that occurred um, 750-ish million years ago. And there's so there's glacial debris around. There's erosional contacts, unconformities. Geologically, it's really interesting, somewhat frustrating sometimes, but it, it's an adventure. So it has been really interesting. Now we're, we're kind of closing in on uh, what we think is going to be our first developed area and, and some production. And, and then it's sort of... Uh, Back to the drawing board. Now we got to go and poke around again and and use the same principles and and find the next one. So what happens if you're drilling uh, wildcat wells and you encounter a big pool of oil? 
to keep your options open, what, would you produce that and sell it or do you have to go to the <laughs> land sale? How does that work? Um, we don't have oil and gas rights. Yeah. In the area that we're working, there isn't very much hydrocarbon. Now, up hole, you know, so there isn't anything in the Cambrian. Up hole, those horizons produce to the east and to the west. So sort of in the uh, Weyburn area and then in southeast Saskatchewan. And what's happened is water influx from this big structure, the Bowden Dome, has come in and, and sort of pushed the hydrocarbons east and west. The area that we're working predominantly looking at right now doesn't have hydrocarbons. If we've made a discovery, we don't have the rights. In some cases, no one has them because no one's really interested in exploring in that area for those reasons. But, I mean, someone could post them. Presumably, there there could be a play developed. But we haven't seen anything yet. The wells that have been drilled, the, the 11 wells that have been drilled on our lands with us in North America, we haven't seen any hydrocarbons. And, and, and it's funny, as a critical mineral, we don't have flow-through, ability to finance with flow-through. This is sort of what we've heard is one of the reasons. Well, what if you find oil and gas? Well, we don't have the rights. It's not really uh, a factor. Um, if we found gas but not helium, it's essentially a dry hole. So in terms of flow through, it would be an exploration miss and the benefits would flow through to the investors. We've been trying to get flow through. It would really help because the helium exploration group as a whole are financially, well, it's tight. It's, it's been difficult to raise money for this, you know, sort of micro cap exploration sector. Flow through would, would really help. The nature of the company is it's sort of a wildcats drill for helium style structure. But as CEO, one of the main jobs of the organization is risk management. How do you <laughs> approach that subject on a drilling style operation? Well, I have three other people in the management group that kind of hold me back because I would be the biggest risk taker. Our board is also really, really solid. When we first jumped into this, we did drill two wells, 100%. And they were 100% dry holes. We learned a lot. And then what happened was interest rates started moving up. Capital started getting tight. So we hit the brakes, then pivoted to our deal with North American Helium to be the driver. They have much deeper pockets than us. We think they've spent about $400 million in Saskatchewan over the last eh, 10 years, but a lot of it in the last three, four years. We started relying on that deal with them to sort of carry us to production. And then we, when cash flow comes, then we can maybe change the risk profile. Having partners is, is a nice way to reduce the risk. As we get more data and we understand the lower part of the section, the, the Cambrian, you know, that's going to reduce the risk too. But it is what it is. We have to be aware of the risks and it, it is a capital intensive business. The wells cost about $2 million to drill. They're pretty easy to complete. They're, they don't, we fracked a couple, but they generally don't require fracks. But still, two to two and a half million dollars is a pretty big throw on a, on a wildcat. When you're, when you're trying to finance these micro cap helium companies, boy, oh boy, it, it's, we, we need to get together and find ways to raise money. And then we need to be very careful about how we throw it around. Because when you go and drill a bunch of dry holes and you have no cash flow or no path to cash flow, the capital markets dry up pretty fast. The prices have gone up, like we mentioned. Have you noticed competition come in? Yeah. When, when we started four years ago, it was sort of like a light bulb went on. They go, helium, boom. And a number of companies got going, a couple of them just ahead of us, a couple of them just behind us. That was why we made the big land grab. Um, and I think we were literally a couple steps ahead of some other people that were looking at the same area and, and maybe a couple steps behind the others. Then it kind of calmed down because the, sort of the staking rush was over. Then people started drilling. Initially, I think there was a little bit of naivety, like, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to drill wells and find a bunch of helium. It turned out to be more difficult. So it's slowed down a lot since. Mm -hmm. Everybody's kind of pulled in a bit and slowed down and gotten a lot more methodical, which is healthy. I'd like to say, I mean, if we had lots of capital, we could move things forward faster. It'd be nice to have $50 million to, to play with. We'd go and drill 10 wells. Um, and you might have, based on the risk that we're seeing, you'd have a couple hits and then you can do some development and 
the facilities are still a challenge. That's maybe a midstreamer will step in there and and help us with that problem. But the the staking rush sort of got everybody set. There was initial sort of drilling flurry, and now it's it's kind of quieted down as people try and get their production on and get some cash flow, and hopefully the next steps will occur in the next year or two, and we'll start seeing some production and, and some more drilling. In the old days of the oil and gas industry, some of the big fortunes were created by that kind of wildcatting geology-led strategy. Do you get the sensors, a bit of that in the helium markets now, or is it too early to t- tell? There was. North American has has drilled a lot of wells. I think they're up to about 80 now. They've been able to raise money in the U.S. markets. They've had some success. They're producing probably 500 MCF a day now. So they're generating cash flow and, and they can, can continue on. I think it started in 2013. They're like seven, eight years ahead of us. Whether we'll get to that point, uh, we'll see. The difference between this and oil and gas is these pools are small. Finding a discovery and having it, you know, run for a 20-mile trend or something, eh, we haven't seen that yet. It looks like it's that's probably a long shot. Small pools, small accumulations. As we get better data, I think we'll get better at finding them. It's not going to be quite like that, but it is wildcat. If we had more control, I think we could hone in on things faster. In the Mancote area that we're looking at now, four years ago, there were, I think, four wells and a couple of them from the 1960s, one from the 1970s. Now I think there's 18. Okay, now we've made some discoveries and you can sort of map a trend, but that's $30 million worth of drilling. The prize is is, is big enough that you can justify that if you got the $30 million. North American did. That's how it looks like it's going to develop. There's... You need the capital up front. You need the risk takers up front. So in that respect, yeah, the wild catters, the the risk takers uh, will be rewarded. Some of the traditional hard rock mining companies that have succeeded over the years took a royalty approach, like Frank in Nevada. Have you ever thought about going down that road to maybe just a royalty model? Um, yeah, the, you know what? This is a, a weird thing. It, it's kind of we're somewhere in between mining and oil and gas. Um, we We were talking to some oil and gas companies about maybe getting involved in this because it's the same skill set. We drill the wells the same. You need, you know, the geology of the Western Canada Basin. We use a lot of geophysics that was shot for oil and gas. No one really is interested. The The risk profile is not anywhere near where oil and gas is nowadays, right? So that, you know, the sort of manufacturing type of things that are going on with, you know, the Montney and uh, the Duvernay and, of course, the oil sands. And then the the mining guys, they're in sort of a – they're at the other end of the spectrum. We're kind of somewhere in between. We're still we, – we still talk to people all the time about it. And we've had lots of people that say, well, once you guys find some stuff, you know, then come back and talk to us. And it's like, well, that's – we need you now. You know, once there's cash flow, there, there's less need to be shaking the coins out of people's pockets. But, you know, nonetheless, we still talk to lots of different entities. In mining, the point is that it's 1 in 10, maybe 1 in 20 in terms of success. If you were to frame it simply for helium, would it it's 1 about, in 5? Uh, it's about 1 in 10 on sort of the, the wildcat exploration wells. But the development wells – are, are not like nine in 10. Um, the development wells are sort of one in three, maybe two in three, because again, these, these pools are relatively small. So you'll see an area where there's a discovery and there's six wells drilled around it and two or three of them are dry holes. And, and geophysically, it, it's really hard to define, especially the, the stuff that's sitting right on the basement. But the prices are good. Other than the risk of a dry hole, what worries you in terms of the business? What keeps you up? The availability of capital is a major challenge for the whole industry. I think there's seven companies, including two privates, sort of operating in our neck of the woods, if you like. Everyone has issues attracting capital. Again, a flow through would really help. There's a, a risk averseness that is prevalent right now. I think a lot of people don't really understand our business too, but interest rates dropping would help as well. Again, I mean, if, if interest rates dropped two or three points, capital becomes more fluid, right? But that's the thing that is our biggest challenge is capital. So we're, we're very careful with how we spend. On the flip side, what's the biggest opportunity for helium evolution? 
Well, we get some discoveries here. We get Mancota going in. The cash flow comes in very quickly. The, the numbers are very robust. And then we can do a lot of things. Get some new seismic, drill more wells. I don't mind the one in 10 uh, exploration risk. I would look for partners. And I think the whole group of small companies, I mean, everybody knows everybody. A lot of them are ex-oil and gas guys. There's a few mining guys around too. So there's deals to be made. That kind of stuff excites me. We've got a, a, a good landman that is a very patient, good deal maker. So there's there's opportunities there. If we had capital, I think we could we could move Canada into the forefront. Saskatchewan wants to be 10% of world supply, which implies about 2 million cubic feet a day. I think uh, right now they're at about 500. So there's a multiple there. It needs a lot of capital to get there. So that's exciting. We get some wells on here in the next 12 months. Then the need to finance changes. You might be able to do bank financing and it opens up a lot of opportunities. Also, some of the hesitant investors uh, may come back saying, okay, you've de-risked it. We believe now. Mm -hmm. So that could open that door again too. Speaking of Saskatchewan, how did you meet Brad Wall and how important has it been to have somebody that tuned in to involved with the company? Well, Brad knew our chairman our, or our chairman knew Brad Wall from his days uh, working in, he worked in Regina for over 30 years and he got to know a lot of the people in business and government in Regina. So he became friendly with Brad Wall, which is, is easy to do. Brad's a very friendly guy. Brad is a big Saskatchewan booster, so anybody that wants to come in and do something that could create jobs and economic opportunity for Saskatchewan is is very welcome. And Brad knows the lay of the land. So in terms of, you know, how do we approach this environmental issues or um, processing or, you know, a liquefaction plant, Brad points us in the right direction, who to talk to. And, uh, and Jim Baker, uh, our chairman, is very tied in with a lot of those guys as well. So they, yeah, that's worked out really well. We got a great board. If you were to leave the master, investor with a final message on helium evolution, what would you tell them? I think we're poised for some really good things over the next 12 months. Stay tuned. We're going to be bringing some production on. We think over the next 12 months, we're probably going to drill 10 plus wells which is a big deal for you know a, a company our size. Now, hopefully the complexion of the company will be a lot different this time next year. So, you know, stay tuned. It's it's going to be exciting. How correct you're listed on the TSX Venture? Exchange. We're on the Venture, yeah. The uh, symbol is heavy, H-E-V-I. It's our little pun on helium. Well, we can end the formal conversation there. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. <laughs> Hello, listeners out there. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Hopefully the episode provided some insights. If you enjoyed the show, check out trose.ca where more episodes are yet to come. You can also subscribe to the podcast where your token of support is much appreciated. Until next time, happy coffee drinking. Happy coffee drinking.